I think a lot of people also don't know the difference between kickboxing and Muay Thai. Can you do like a simple yeah, differentiation yeah. between kickboxing and Muay Thai? There's a big difference. Right. And I'm a real purist with it. Uh, uh, for me, the, the Muay Thai is, should be done with a Y crew, with elbows, with uh, um, a, it's a five round fight too. And the Muay Thai fight is like chapters of a book. First round is, there's no clinching. The referee will break you up if right. you start doing that. Um, and it starts out kind of a feel out period. Uh, a real fast starter in Muay Thai, they consider that like ugly. They don't want to see it. I remember them telling me too, don't start too fast, fight Muay Chalat, fight smart in the beginning. And then the second round picks up. And if you notice the music, the live band corresponds with that too. Right, it's a lot slower, yeah. different beats per minute. Yeah, in by the, the third round. round, they're picking it up. They're, you know, you'll see a little bit of clinch, a little bit of elbow stuff, but round four and five is primarily, entirely, all clinch and knee work and elbow work. And the flutes and the drums are the pace Cranking. is way, yeah. way, way faster. Yeah. And the round four and five is all clinch and knee work. And in, in, in Thai boxing, the clinch and knee, which you don't see in kickboxing. Right, no. okay, that's another differentiation point. Is really worked on a lot. In, in Thailand. I mean, you have, they call it plum. Plum yeah. session, we used to always go 20 minutes straight, nonstop, and it's clinch and knee sparring. And we still do it here all the time. You have to, to have that range of combat proficient. And uh, they work on that a lot. I know that uh, some of the uh, kickboxing uh, uh, promoters and whatnot didn't like that. They didn't think it looked good or whatever. And I can understand that too. Some of the grappling in MMA is tend to be shied away from. And I can see that too. I don't like to see someone on the ground stalemated too. You know, right. Because then there's no action almost. Right. And uh, I don't think that's the case with, with Muay Thai, but that's been a little bit of an argument for them to not have it and to do kickboxing. But do you feel... In, in regards to MMA, they don't allow knees on the ground, but they do allow elbows. And I sometimes feel like the elbows are just as devastating as the knees. Obviously, you know, it's the lower extremity, so it seems like there's more power. Do you think they should incorporate both knees and elbows on the ground? Well, I don't think you can do that many knees on the Correct. ground. So it's just that, that fact alone is going to eliminate a lot of it. But it's not that the elbows are... They're, they're mainly a cutting tool, and of course, there's no glove on the elbow or right. nothing. So, you know, that's a, that's a factor. But really, your most dangerous technique and most of your fatalities in Thai boxing, too, are from knees to the head. You know, uh. the, and we've all seen the fights with, uh, you know, uh, back in the day with uh, Rich Franklin and Anderson Silva, with uh, 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 Rampage and... Uh, uh, Vanderlei, you know, stuff like, I mean, it was brutal. I mean, seeing that stuff, you know. What a crowd pleaser, though, seeing that kind of Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, but that's when you see uh, Thai boxing, when the, when the guys are, are, are dying. That's what it's from. <laughs> and what do, you, what do you feel about the difference in, in, in training between the U.S. and in Thailand? Is, well, is, there, is there such a... Yeah, it's easy. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like soccer. It's it's new to the U.S. and it's catching on. Right. And it's it's funny. I've I've gravitated to all, all these kind of sports that are kind of American. Right. And uh, one of my thing was Schutzen German protection dog training. Very little you hear of it in the states. Big in Europe. Same like Muay Thai. Big in Thailand and Europe too. I mean, the Dutch had been doing it for years. The French are really proficient, you know, have been doing it. And the reason being, you know, Muay Thai was illegal in the States for a long time. Correct. I mean, flat out illegal. Even Southern California in the 90s, I do believe you can't even clinch your knee. Right. It was the kickboxing rules. I remember the first time I went to Thailand, they just made me feel like a wuss, man. Where are you from? Oh, U.S. Oh, man, you guys can't. My me sock, my me cow, couldn't eat, couldn't elbow, couldn't even kick the leg. I think back then I was like PKA in boxing right. or whatever. They did say Muay Thai was dirty fighting. Muay Thai was uh, uh, barbaric. It's not, you know, whatever. 
It's just ignorance. I mean, we're here to lift the veil of ignorance. Same thing when I first started using the name Sityatong, my camp in Thailand, give me the name, I'm all proud of it, I'm using the name. And even my wife said, oh, I don't know if people can get that, it's too exotic or weird, weird or whatever. You no, know, no, it's time to, to educate, educate them and it, you know, it's really important, that's really important. It's the same thing with using those techniques. I mean, it's the same thing with the Y crew. You know, um, it is a sport that's significant. Uh, those, those things are significant to those things in that sport, and they're a big part of it. Would you say your first real exposure to Muay Thai was with crew Nanfa? Yeah, for sure. I was, uh, uh, I was just blown away by him. Him, the first influence, of course, uh, the first influence, I remember my cousin Jack coming home from Vietnam who got to train with some Thai boxers in, Thai, uh, in, in Thailand that were, when he was in Vietnam. And he was just like, Walt, well, you gotta learn. And I was living in Indiana, learning some you know, traditional martial arts. Saw Bruce Lee enter the dragon, of course, right, like a right. million other guys. And uh, wow, this is what I wanna do. And uh, I'll tell you, I remember my cousin, he came home from Vietnam and he was like, really, I mean, you wanna get some martial arts that really handles their business? You need to do some Muay Thai. And I'm like, where the hell am I gonna do that? Come right, on. right. And I came Cause to- Cause you were still training in JKD then. Well, that was when I was living in the Midwest. Oh, okay. And then when I came to California, I got exposed to JKD. And that was karate? When you yeah, still... it was karate, yeah, okay. some traditional stuff, I don't remember it, Okinawan something or other. <laughs> right. But uh, when I came to California, went to IMB Academy, and you know, I was blown away by uh, uh, Dan Asano, Richard Bastillo, and all those guys, a big influence. And they did a lot for exposing a lot of different martial arts, too. So I remember Rich telling me, uh, you got to see this guy a lot. And uh, I remember just being blown away by him. Just yeah, the power, yeah, the speed, yeah, the tenacity. Everything. I remember sparring with him. I couldn't touch him. He was just clowning us all. And I started training with him. He started me fighting my first amateur fight. This was like in the 80s. And 1991, he passed away, and I ended up selling my stuff and took off and moved to Thailand. Yeah, what? I didn't stay, I never stayed in Thailand. I really lived there. I would stay there long enough so I wouldn't have to. Uh, fill out a, the visa and the paperwork. I'd come back to the States and I'd go back pretty frequently. And uh, that's when I started at Sityatong Camp at that time. But th there's an integral part to that story where you lose your, 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 your head crew, the yeah. one who introduces everything to right. you. And there, there's something that goes through your brain where you go, you know what, I, I can't live here in, in America. I'm gonna move to Thailand. Well. Or, or I'm gonna be bouncing back and forth and I sell everything. Well, I did, yeah, I didn't know what to do. I had a f fight coming up, uh, no coach, no nothing, and uh, was with Cam Nark and uh, uh, Nanfa's best friend, Super Chai, that really helped me out. And Your they, second crew. Yeah, and then uh, they wrote me a letter. To, they said, you gotta go see Kriya Tong and Patia. He's the best. And who's to know, you know, Years later, in 2003, I'd be opening up a city tongue camp on my right. own. But uh, um, they give me a letter to get in the camp. There weren't many foreigners uh, that were taken seriously at that time. And they wrote me the letter to, to get in the camp. I had went to Thailand, went to Pattaya. This is in 91. And that's when I started with Sitya Tong after Nanfa died. And it was kind of almost like a spiritual thing where the torch was passed from, from this to that to a, to a higher level. And it really was. And I've been with Sitya Tong ever since. What's an example of like where you got the foreigner treatment? Like, hey, he's a white guy. Maybe we should kind of pull back on showing techniques. A lot of that was prevalent in the 80s and the 90s. Well, they did. They didn't really take you seriously. Um, the guys, the, most of them that I know um, that were there at the time didn't, they wanted to train and, and go out to party and, and do stuff uh, that was, Thailand's a lot of fun. And, uh, 
and that's a whole different story. Of it's just too dangerous to do that, man. I mean, and they will throw you to the lions. They'll throw you to the dogs. You get in a situation where you, uh, it's out of your control. You're at the mercy where they're going to put you to fight and whatnot. And, you know, oh, kick the bag. That's enough training. I was uh, lucky enough to have a, uh, some friends in Thailand that took me to camp and uh, um, they had got Kuya Tong to really look out for me. And he did too, man. He treated me like a son for many years. And uh, I'm very thankful for him. I'm real grateful to uh, have all the Thai people treated me very well. Uh, How long did it take for them to see, okay, you know what, he's He's with this camp. He's he's with it. He's no a longer while. It took, a while. Yeah, coming back in uh, uh, probably uh, five six years. Five six years yeah. for acceptance. Yeah. Were you ever thrown into uh, a pit also, and you were asked like Walter, go fight this guy? Oh, of course. Yeah, everybody has to. You know, I mean uh, that's just uh, and the the foreigners they don't at that time they didn't think. That, that we had what it took to, and the work ethic was a big thing too, that we had what it took in terms of work, work ethic uh, to, do, to do what the ties did and the drive and whatnot. I remember uh, kids asking me, hey, why are you here, man? You don't have to be here. This was like, and I felt sorry for those kids when I was staying there at the camp and living there too, because you know, they didn't have girlfriends, they didn't have uh, uh, BB guns, they didn't, you know, do much. It was fighting and that was it, you know, right. there was no lives. But, uh, yeah, it, uh, it took a long time. It took a so, long time. so we are fortunate to live in America and train and have the choice yeah. and method of training with, like, legendary folks like we're, yourself. We're fortunate, but then again, we're not because it's almost too easy. A lot of Americans, too, uh, will want to, you know, buy stuff or get things really quickly. And the, the Thai method of teaching is very slow. I uh, uh, tell some of my students, or I don't tell them, but I think to myself, man, I wish I, I, wish I had a teacher like myself when right. I was coming up that could show you this stuff quickly and explain it to you, you know, and can speak Thai and can, you know, and been through that and been through the hardships and can, you know, kind of shortcut a few things for you because uh, it, it took a real long time. And the, the Thai way is, you know, it's slow. Those kids are there from when they're little kids up to where they're adults. I know guys there that are, you know, their whole lives that are still hanging around the camp, hold pads, you know, go around there, it's a family. You know, and Sit Ya Tong, it all comes down to uh, Kru Ya Tong and how he, he treated the, um, it was a family. I mean, you're talking about, about a guy that wins the lottery, uh, gives almost all the money away to the poor, and helped a lot of people, you know? And uh, if we could strive to be like that, I mean, that's what it's all about, you know? If we could put around that, put a, up that Sit Ya Tong family vibe, that's, that's really the goal. Right, to share with like the, the viewers, we, we spoke Thursday and you, you had mentioned people would be waiting in line. And giving him stories, if you could elaborate just for, for a little bit um, on like how Kuya Tong. After Kuya Tong won the lottery, the, uh, and he had a big heart, man. I mean, uh, he did a lot of stuff. I mean, Sitya Tong was also an orphanage, Muay Thai camp. I mean, uh, ah. he, wasn't, he wasn't a rich man, you know, but uh, here's a guy that uh, had acquired a lot of money, but. Uh, he was there to help people out. He was a real humanitarian. And, uh, yeah, there was a, a while there after he won the lottery that people were lining up and they were, you know, giving their hard luck stories and this and that. I lost my job, man. I have no money. I can't feed my kids, this and that. Okay, line him up. Okay, here's 20,000 baht or whatever. And Okay, next. And then, you know, it was just... You just don't see that that often. No, or if not at all no. nowadays. You know, no. it's all about affiliate schools yeah. and how much royalties you can but get. But what you give comes back to you. If you believe that then too, that's, uh, you know, it's deeper than uh, just some materialistic bullshit. Now, your school has a, 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 a treacherous rep for being a clinch academy. You know, really good rep for, in the clinch. Uh, and your instructorship, 
How, how, how do you differentiate or teach the clinch? That's a good uh, question. That's a good question, Charles. Um, I teach, and I never heard this uh, uh, described before, I teach three clinches. Okay. There's only three in Muay Thai. Not one. There's no Thai clinch and that's it, right? Right. There's the neck, they call ka. There's the arm and shoulder, arm and shoulder, lie can. And there's the L. L means hips. So there's three really uh, clinch positions. The neck, a ka, the lie can, the arm and shoulder, and then the, the hip, the L. Everything else is a variation or a combination of those three. And if you get the basic framework of those three and you build your your combinations of different aspects of the three, then you build on the balance and the the idea is when someone is on one leg being they're throwing a knee, so you know they're they're throwing a knee strike so they'll be on one leg is to you use your your timing to upset their balance there. There's not judo throws or flips or anything like that it kind of looks like it sometimes right which it's hard to score if someone doesn't know real muay thai techniques i know some of the judges and referees they're kind of lost because they they well, go to referee school mickey mouse referee well school there's two so if you don't know the the real uh, uh technique of muay thai it's real hard to judge and and score it too and uh that's an important factor but yeah three clinches and later, hopefully, you could, we just film you showing the three different variations of okay. that, too. Okay, yeah. Um, what do you, are there any fighters out there that you see like, man, this young buck's got something going, like fighters like Joe Schilling or Oh, I've known like Joe that. a long time, yeah. He's, uh, uh, he's really lighting it up. I mean, and the guy's got major heart, too. Him and Mark Kimura's so dope. He's, he's a great instructor, too. He's an old friend, yeah. He, 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 Mark, I've known Mark for years. At uh, Joe's fight with uh, Simon Marcus, well, there's been three of them, and the last one was just unreal. And Simon is just a beast. He's like uh, the best on the planet. Right. Know? Much respect to him. And his his coach, uh, John Suchart, is an old friend of mine too. I know him from Thailand. Uh, he's a Sit Ya Tong uh, uh, affiliate. No. Came Part from of Sit Yes. He fought for Sit Ya Tong. A lot of people don't know this, but his. Uh, Fighting name was uh, Den Glai Sit Ya Tong, and he he fought for Kri Ya Tong. Not a, not a real uh, super major, but uh, very well respected, and was a longtime student of Kri Ya Tong. And uh, yeah, deep roots. Now, outside of Muay Thai, you have two um, invested hobbies to serious side careers. One of them is uh, training dogs. How did you get into that? You know uh, the. I've always been uh, uh, involved with German Shepherds especially, right. and uh, I saw um, there's a, a group here locally that I, I, I met uh, uh, that was doing some uh, Schutzen protection work with the sleeve and whatnot, and when I saw it I was like, wow, it's like Muay Thai training, right. bad work. And I was like uh, just uh, fascinated by it. And I started training a dog. Next thing you know, uh, I started relating some of my uh, uh, fighting, fight uh, coaching uh, to, the, to the dog training, building uh, confidence, putting the fighters away when they still wanted more, building drive, uh, things like that. And, uh, you know, it, it sounds kind of, uh, well, it's thinking outside the box. And is that something where you can offer people like services at this point, or do you do you? Pick no, I do the it dogs? for a hobby. I can. I uh, breed some high-level uh, protection working dogs, and you know, I I, I do sell them occasionally, and uh, I, I do train dogs, but I, I don't have enough time. Okay. Yeah. This part of the show is where you get to put yourself on the spotlight on blast. So I just have a few questions, and then you say either or. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Yeah. K1 or Glory. Um, well, I don't think K1 is, Glory's on the, the up, up, up shoot now. Um, K1, I, I don't hear that much uh, about The production's anymore. amazing for Glory. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Uh, Thailand in the 90s or Thailand today? 
Oh, 90s for sure. Yeah. Why the Why the 90s? Actually, late 80s or early late 80s, 90s. early 90s. Well, they called it the golden era. Correct. I mean, it has to do with uh, technology. It has to do with economy. It has to do with desire and the techniques. I mean, there's never going to be. I mean, you see the footage of some of the stuff the guys were doing back then. I mean, Sanchai's pretty incredible, but I mean, uh, uh, the, the fighters back in the day, um, ridiculous. One of my favorites and uh, a coach to me, uh, of mine too, uh, Gong Talani Piakalun, older brother of Samat Piakalun, who is, Samat's my idol, but uh, Gong Talani, Champion in four different weight classes, kind of like Pacquiao right, in uh, right. Muay Thai. Uh, he would clean out weight classes, man. I mean, and, and four weight classes in Muay Thai is equivalent to like eight in boxing, right? Slim Peeny Stadium, right. too, with his, you know, was the slaughterhouse back then, <laughs> right? You know, and uh, I don't know, just seeing Muay Thai back at that time, it was, it was wicked. It was brutal. You were caged up outside the bedding and all that. It was kind of seedy. It was, you know, it was. Uh, military keeping the bottles from flying and it was hardcore man it really is to me real Muay Thai and traditional Muay Thai is is the most hardcore it's uh it can be kind of insane sometimes and I like that aspect yeah, but of it, it it's what came out first always has to be like the original song the first group to put it out you know that yeah. there's just something about that and a couple more Harley or Suzuki Oh, Harley. I mean, the classic. Okay. Yeah. Smith & Wesson or Glock? Glock. I'm a Glock guy. Now, you're also a big, uh, big into shooting. Yeah, I'm a USPSA uh, shooter. And uh, one of my students, I, I, my thing now has uh, been three gun, pistol rifle and shotgun. And uh, I shoot production w with a Glock 34, too. And uh, yeah, Glock is the, I don't know, it's just, the customizing of them, yeah, you can draw, they're like AK-47. Doesn't pistol. jam? No, no. They're, uh, I it, mean, they're not the Infinities or the 2011s, the, the next level of the 1911 pistol, so you're not gonna spend four grand on a Glock, but uh, they're incredible guns, I like them. How does that, is it different or is it the same type of energy and, or refreshment when you use a gun? to release like that and or how is it different or yeah that's a good question uh, because the stress relief you get from shooting and competing too i mean I, i'm a competitive dude i i competed with with dogs i competed you know now with with pistols and three gun and uh you know, 52 so i'm not going to be fighting and living vicariously through my fighters just wasn't enough so i had to do something you know no more motorcycles, a couple of wrecks on those, and that uh, was too much. But uh, uh, the uh, competitive uh, stuff, it's, it's in your blood, it's in your blood. And, and how did you get into the shooting? I had a student that was a really proficient uh, three-gunner. Right. And uh, it was like a... And he just invited you? Yeah, he took me out. I was hooked immediately. Boom, yeah. off the jump. Yeah, it's a martial art. You right. Know, so. Robert White is his name. The guy's a super guy. He's a really good shooter. He introduced me to Taron Butler and all these superstar grandmaster shooters and stuff. And now uh, Taron Butler, who is like three gun champion, is uh, he's one of my private Muay Thai students now too. Nice. Yeah. Good for you. And last one, uh, Doberman or German Shepherd? German Shepherd. Yeah. Why the breed? Um, I think the only breed that's going to come close to German Shepherd is Belgian Malinois, but they're a little smaller. Uh, the German Shepherd, the Dobermans are never going to be uh, the versatility of the, they'll never beat the versatility of the German Shepherd. They're, they're big, powerful, they can track, they can, they have a lot of drive. The muzzle on my working dog is this long, it's like getting bit by a crocodile. And. Uh, they don't quit. I mean, a real working line. Now you got to get one from Europe, though. You got to get a, and they're not cheap. They're real expensive. What? what what's? It, is it just because it's the lineage of, of the dog? Is this really? It is well exactly crafted? that. It's the what they call it, the uh, breed standard. The okay. in Europe they don't just let the dogs be bred and. Uh, 
mixed or Gallivan. whatever. Not only that, but they have to be Schutzen, which is a dog sport, which is protection work, tracking and obedience, three phases. The dogs that are bred and sold as German Shepherds in Europe. I like the ones especially from the Czech Republic. They're just, uh, they have to be trained and titled in the Schutzen dog sport to be bred and have puppies. Otherwise they, I don't know if they put them down or they do, right. you know, they just, they're not bred. That's the breeding standard. They have to have at least a Schutzen one. They have uh, two and three is the highest level. But uh, I don't know, it, it, maybe you could think of it as kind of a master race thing or maybe inhumane, you know, to do that. But the breed standard is very high because of that. So you get some really high level dogs. Well, I appreciate the talk.